So thank you all so much for joining us this evening. And as many of you already know, I know so many of you have been in and out of partnership and conversation with us throughout this past year. But tonight is one of the really important milestones in the research project that we at Fordham University have been conducting this academic year in partnership with LSA. So we've been generously sponsored by a grant from Fordham Center for Community Engaged Learning. Thank you, Julie. She may not be here yet, but um, Julie Gaffney um, has helped facilitate that grant. And she, I think, will be here at some point this evening. And we had funding this year to support a small team of faculty, myself, Dr. Carrie Caston, and Dr. Larry Farmer, and a small group of graduate and undergraduate students, all of whom you'll meet tonight. Um, we've been researching LSA, particularly conducting interviews with some longstanding staff members and clients who had been involved in the parent child development program many years ago, some as many as 20 years ago. And with the help of Inhinia Garcia, a former staff member at LSA, um, we tracked down about 18 families and interviewed them all in Spanish, thanks to the skills of our faculty and students hoping to learn about the role that LSA played in their lives so many years ago when they first came to the United States, where they engaged services, what happened to them subsequently. Um, and in English also, several of our students interviewed some longstanding fast staff members, board members, and we wanted to learn about the longer history of LSA's work, its mission, its animating spirit, its effectiveness. Um, and the students and faculty also researched some of LSA's archival materials, so really old articles published by um, people, many of who are on the Zoom tonight, published by former staff members, um, current staff members, old newspaper articles, even things from the New York Times, um, and in other kind of Catholic presses, um, just helping us put the story together about the work of LSA and its presence in East Harlem. Um, and we're going to hear tonight about the students, the students' impressions of what they have learned. And one of the things that we'll hear about tonight is one of, as we met over the course of this year about what we're hearing from the former clients and what we're learning from the archives and from the staff, we were trying to think of what might be like a through line and a red thread that might help kind of thematize or put into a narrative the story of the work of LSA? What might kind of thread these stories together? What, st what themes highlight? And one of the themes that we've chosen to highlight is this theme of um, what has been called in much of the LSA literature, mutuality, sort of this animating spirit of mutuality um, based on a model of LSA staff being in relationship, relationships of mutuality with the families they serve, um, a model of service, but also crucially empowerment. And so we asked, you know, what does this model of mutuality look like on the ground? When is mutuality effective? What kind of model of community service, solidarity, justice look like? Um, and our hopes was we might put together and we will be putting together an academic article that might help really coherently tell the story of LSA. And tonight's presentations are the students' efforts to articulate to us what they learned about LSA and mutuality in the course of their research. And tonight's presentations are the first time really that the faculty on the research team are really hearing from their research. So this after tonight really culminates the students' contributions to the project. And after this, um, they will be done. We have some students graduating from the School of Social Work, from undergraduate programs at Fordham. And so this is sort of the, the culmination of, um, the students, of the students' contribution. And then over the summer, the faculty will use their, um, use their research to um, write an article. And so they will, each of the students, will present for five minutes. And then we will have a really brief period where the faculty will respond. And then we'll be so excited to open it up to the LSA community to hear your feedback, what you think was interesting. You know, We're still in kind of draft workshop mode here. Um, and so we really look forward to hearing from you. And then Dr. Carrie Kasten will offer some concluding reflections. So um, I will begin by turning it over to our first student, Rosanna Conforme, who's a graduate student in the School of Social Work. So um, Rosanna, thank you so much for starting us off. 
And mm -hmm. Rosanna, I got your PowerPoint. Do you want me to share now? You just give yeah. me instruction. And you can share it now and I will let, I'll guide you when to change it. So hello everyone. Um, good evening and also like a happy spring, nice weather outside. Um, so I just wanna start by just talking a little bit about my reflections um, and how I saw this project and really end um, with sort of the similar, uh, sort of the similar um, things that I wanna say around the organization itself. So I myself have been in the nonprofit world for over 20 years. Um, and it's really been amazing to see um, some of the work that LSA has done and the tremendous impact the organization has had on the families it serves. As a first generation immigrant and indigenous Latina, I was moved, I was really moved to see the work that LSA has done for members of my community. Um, as a person who lived half her life in impoverished neighborhoods, I even appreciate it more, your, your extensive work in addressing intergenerational poverty. Um, I do find it crucial for community-based organizations like LSA to address and really support poverty alleviation um, work itself. And so that, that way we can try to shift the narratives for children who grow up in these environments and to also reduce the long-term impact that intergenerational poverty can have on children. All that to say is that I think LSA is doing such an influential work um, in every single level. I have completely been inspired and humbled, quite frankly, in being able to interview a few of the families, read the transcripts, and really just bear witness to their story, their hardships, their resilience, and their strength. Um, all this was very powerful to me. Their narratives were definitely filled with tremendous gratitude, many of them expressing deep appreciation for the support LSA provided them, particularly during very difficult times. Um, as I became more immersed in the project itself, I started connecting the family stories to the mission, to the work of LSA, and I found a few things that I wanted to share with you today. Um, next slide. First of is, all, is I, the view, uh, are you guys seeing the full screen? Because I'm seeing a bunch of notes and stuff. You're on mute, Brenna. If by full screen you mean uh, different identities with a person and different uh, things coming off yes. of it, we're good. And then next okay. to that is the next slide, intersectionality and much smaller. Yeah. yeah okay. We, yeah, we see it as. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I observed that these families had intersecting identities of class, status, um, education, language, culture, and gender, just to name a few. Uh, many of the mothers we spoke to had different citizenship and immigration status. Uh, many of them had less than high school educations. Um, they were seemingly working poor or working class or not working at all. Many of them really made a comparison between education opportunities in this country and the barriers that, to education in, that exist in their countries as well, including how poverty and gender further impacted these um, opportunities, especially for women. So the survey participants really saw the need for intergenerational mobility and this influenced sort of their decisions to migrate to this country and allow them to strongly encourage the importance of education to their children. The next slide. Um, the surveys themselves were impactful roads to these families lived experiences and deeply highlighted the intersectionality of poverty, housing, education and gender and its impact on marginalized communities. Again, this is only a few of the intersections that I identified, there are many more. Next slide. Overall, the survey participants talked about the struggles with access to food, healthcare, employment and housing and economic sustainability. Some of the homes were single parent households, some were experiencing some form of domestic violence while others were going through some immigration or court process. Again, these were definitely themes that I picked up. I know there was, there's a lot more but because of the limited time, I wanna concentrate on highlighting the overarching intersecting inequality, I'm sorry, inequities that LSA has addressed for the programming and particularly to the programming that the participants accessed and named during the interviews. Next slide. So first of all, LSA really took a strong role to improve food security. Um, a lot of the survey participants talked about food insecurity and shared that LSA helped them get access to food by providing them with pantries and food distribution. Um, some of them talked about even being helped during the times of COVID when they necessarily didn't have any food and they were not working. Um, next slide. LSA took uh, also a lot of a leading role in addressing educational justice. 
many of the survey participants talked about LSA, LSA connecting them to education programs for their children, um, holding um, after school programs and tutoring, which their children, many of them attended. Um, they talked about their college readiness, um, that they were provided with English classes and sometimes as well as GD courses for them to attend. Next slide. LSA was also involved in health justice. Um, survey participants shared that they were given health referrals, that they were connected to healthcare facilities, and they were provided with reproductive health services. And for some families, um, they highlighted that they were referred to or they were given speech and physical therapy, particularly their children. Next slide. Um, LSA was also involved in healing justice. Um, many of the participants also shared that they were able to access LSA's counseling services, which were both culturally affirming and trauma informed. So they were very happy about some of many of the services as um, that I'm highlighting here as some of the services that they really were able to access from LSA. Next slide. Many of the participants shared that LSA fostered supportive parenting. Um, they talked about how LSA empowered them by teaching them to be better parents and how the home visits and parenting groups helped them attain more tools and create community. Um, they felt that this helped shift into generational patterns of parenting. And through that change, um, it helped them increase and strengthen their communication and relationship with their children. Next slide. This was very exciting for me to see the ways the organization has addressed systemic issues that impact marginalized communities. These surveys, um, I can say, really showcase how LSA is heavily involved in and committed to all these movements and practices, while also taking a holistic and trauma-informed approach in service delivery. Next slide. I also was very, 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 um, I think it was an admiration that I felt the fact that the organization was able to incorporate the concept of self-determination, mutuality, and a three-phase model in the programming as a service provider is very powerful for me to see as well. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier throughout the service, there was a lot of sharing of gratitude, appreciation and admiration at LSA and for the people they worked with. So um, here are some quotes um, that is being shared on the screen that were shared by many of the participants. Um, as you can see and tell, LSA changed um, their lives and had a tremendous impact on on the clients that, that were served from through this organization. Um, next slide. And this is my final slide. It's been truly an honor to be part of this project and to get to know LSA, to see the deep connection between LSA and its community and the powerful impact that I saw um, just knowing uh, about this organization just now during this project and also just by the conversations I've had with the members and the participants, um, the powerful impact that you're having um, in addressing social issues and social problems within this community is very important and crucial. Um, and I congratulate you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosanna. Thank you very much for the beautiful slides, especially I love the quotes on the slides. Well, we will keep going. Um, uh, next we have uh, Dita, also from the School of Social Work. Dita DeBroshi. Thank you, Rosanna. You know what, Dita, I think you're still muted. There you oh. go. Thank you so much. So I want to begin again, like Rosanna, thanking you for giving me the opportunity to work in this project with everyone. I really enjoyed learning what LSA means to the immigrant families. Being an immigrant myself, I really would like a program like LSA for myself and my family, especially in the beginnings of immigration, because those are so crucial, crucial, critical years. And the way that you develop during those years can really can especially the children, can really impact your future. So the three-phase model, Sister Suzanne and Sister Margaret described mutuality as, quote, really saying that we're all in this together. The three-phase model, you help families, you help to find and respond to the crisis, you help them get access to the needs and programs, et cetera, what they need in order to improve their life. 
And this is what I found of LSA. They really help families through the programs and through advocacy. And the, the help of the family, it's like, it's a holistic approach. And it's not only the individual, it's not only the mother, it's not only the, the woman, the, but it's the whole family. And as the family is strengthened, community is strengthened and society is strengthened. Loretta T truly felt that, quote, we were all in this together as she describes a coexistence. She reports that the sisters always saw that her and her family's needs were met and that the help would improve their life. The English classes were very important throughout the interviews. Um, English, you know, English is my third language, so I understand how important it is to communicate. And as you communicate, you get accepted into society. And it's part of the culture. As you learn Eng English, you become part of the larger culture, part of community. And Elizabeth C says, right, because I don't know people. It was from work to home. There I started with Les Hermanitas who were giving English classes. I started learning all that. Then my daughter started going to school. I went to my English classes with Les Hermanitas and that's where I learned to grow. After the first level, I met people. Second level, third level, when I needed something more, they told me you have to go somewhere else. And she got referred somewhere else and learned English and was able to integrate. Not only were the women and the mothers educated through English, but the children were educated. It was very important that they reach their potential, that they reach their goals, that they go to college, that they go to universities, that they go to good high schools. And Claudia V describes, thanks also to education. When my son entered high school before in the sisters, there was a person named Martha. She's the one who helped a lot, helped many families get into many schools very good Catholic schools for boys, for girls. I was fortunate that my son entered one of those schools and that of the programs that's, that's they had. Thankfully, my son qualified. He finished his high school there at the school and then went on to his university. So you can see that Claudia's example, her children went on to university and went on to being able to be successful and integrated people in the community. There's also the parenting program or the mother's program, which is very important because as an immigrant, you usually come by yourself or your nuclear family, and you don't have your mom or your grandmother to help you breastfeed, for example, show you how to change a diaper. And LSA steps right in with the mothering program or with the parenting program. Claudia V describes, I went to the program because it was there for pregnant women and for those with babies. I went to the program for instruction because the, there they even taught you how to put on the diaper, how to breastfeed the baby when the baby was born. Even the nurse sister, Susan Daly, she had a doll that taught you how you were going to clean up the navel to cure the baby. That's why it interested me because I was going to be a mother for the first time. And it's this mother for the first time concept and a citizen and a person in the society. And she also worked in the thrift store, which gave her economic help, and she worked there for 18 years. There's also the asthma program. Marcella describes that the asthma program not only taught them about asthma, but they advocated for Marcella, and they gave them pumps and medication. She describes LSA had a program still, and they had a lot with medicine, sometimes giving us pumps little things or little tips that we need, like how to clean our house, things that, like that. Even let's say there's something wrong in the house, they help us because it is hard to know what to do. And sometimes the building manager, he doesn't, he doesn't listen to us, but the LSA people will write a letter to the manager, then they listen and they explain to us why things like mold is very bad if you have asthma and so many people in our home have it. They're very helpful. So there was an advocacy for the manager as well. So there's an advocacy in the, in the community and there's a togetherness and a, a, a togetherness and cohesiveness in the community, LSA as a family. And throughout the interviews, like Rosanna said, there's gratitude. As Elizabeth says, for me, I say the love, the appreciation of those little sisters, the truth, they made me feel like family when I needed their help. Maricela says, yes, very close friends that maybe sometimes you don't think about it, but when you're going through hard things, you look at it and you're like, wow, these are really, really friends. They're really here for us. 
I feel like those are the people that have been very helpful and are just giving us a helping hand whenever we need it. So LSA really has the pulse on the community. The, the, they give them what is needed and what is needed that's long lasting. It's good for the individual, for the family and for the community and society as a whole. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Dita, thank you so much for all those lovely quotes from the interviews. Thank you so much, Dita. Uh, wonderful. Well, we will keep moving along and I'm sure you're thinking of um, questions and comments. So we'll save those to the end. And we will move now to Melinda. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm using two different audios because, or two, a video and audio because I don't trust my internet tonight. So. Um, thank you so much for coming out. And I, as I'm looking across the screen, I'm seeing, you know, the, the older generation meeting the newer generation and vice versa. And I think this is like the best thing ever to bridge between those two, um, on such an important topic. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I did a presentation for the, um, CARS research program symposium a few weeks ago. And so I've um, had this presentation available and I wanted to share it with you as well. So as a MSW student, I've been working with Dr. Farmer this year um, as a research assistant. And um, when I had the opportunity to join this project, I was really excited because um, it's not only a, um, a social service agency, but it's also a historical look at um, the impact that it's had here in East Harlem in New York. Um, so in the beginning, when we started the project, there was this question presented of what makes LSA so special? and um, as we started asking questions and looking at the information and um, talking to families, the theme of mutuality came up a lot. And so we started looking at that in more depth um, with the power with relational model of care. Um, and we really saw it being infused into the fiber of the partnerships um, across the board, really. Um, that it started out early on and you know, continues even still today. Um, I did, for the presentation, I did a video. Um, I don't trust my internet <laughs> to play this well, so I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to play that, but it's um, the LSA of yesterday and today video that um, highlighted, it's on YouTube, I can pop the link in the chat as well. Um, but it highlighted the beginning stages of LSA and then where it grew into today, starting with this older building on, on the left side and now the new building on the right side. Um, the interdisciplinary study has been really fa uh, fascinating. Um, we brought together um, the School of Arts and Sciences and Social Services to look at these different um, topics that came up. The, um, the research um, study itself, we started working with 40 families and tried to do interviews with the staff and all of the different families. Um, I myself worked mostly with the staff. I actually did not interview any of the families themselves, um, but I had the privilege of interviewing uh, Gail Norman and Ralph uh, uh, Siciliano and Lorraine Tierney as well. So it's good to see Gail and Lorraine here on the call as well. Um, I thought it was really fascinating, the three-phase model where um, LSA was really trying to get access to resources and training and education for the families, um, being able to provide access and then educating them on all of the different things that they were going to need to um, thrive here in the city, um, and then also to be able to help them um, train someone else following. Um, I thought that was a fantastic model that's easily um, rep 
replicable and able to you know be used well into the future um, that was one of the things that i took away from the study was that um, not only is it a catalyst for change the the theme of mutuality and the three-phase model but also what i saw it was also as a bridge um, for for social change as well um, because i was interviewing staff um, particularly ralph as a board member i thought it was interesting um, to see how we could bridge um, through events, um, whether it be volunteering or whatnot, where um, staff and faculty could could even work alongside the families as well and things like that. Um, I think that the three phase model would really lend itself well to that and um, could be something really great to use in the future as well. Um, but I think it's a good it's a good organizational quality that can be used for other organizations across the country and um, especially in working with immigrant populations. So that is the end of my presentation and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Melinda. Thank you very much. We'll have to uh, check out your YouTube video if, if you put it in the chat, but thank you very much. That it was wonderful to hear from you. Um, and so we will keep going down. We now have Maddie. And Maddie is an undergraduate student at Fordham's uh, Lincoln Center campus. The last three students were at our School of Social Work graduate students. So thank you so much, Maddie. Welcome. Okay, sorry, that took a little bit to come up. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much um, to everyone in attendance. Um, working on this project this entire academic year has been truly an honor learning about the approach of LSA and the lasting impact that it has had on families in East Harlem has been incredible. Um, so this academic year, as you know from um, from what the other students have already said, we, uh, the group of faculty and students um, with a comprehensive interview question packet, um, we're able to speak with immigrant families residing in East Harlem, particularly um, immigrant women. Uh, and that's who I am going to be focusing on. I didn't really um, interview the staff, but, um, the themes that we analyzed with these interviews and um, in examining the impact that LSA has had on these families um, is mutuality, the three-phase model, and community health. Um, so I found that these approaches were extremely significant because the immigrant woman in particular is um, someone in, in society who's often silenced, who um, does not have her voice amplified but in hearing directly from them, um, it was incredible to see how they have been empowered by the organization. Um, so some things that I noticed um, through my interviewing and then through analyzing the data have been sustained relationships. Um, so not any kind of superficial, um, like here is one service and we'll send you on your way. LSA sustains relationships with its clients, which is extremely important and leads to that that value of mutuality, which is um, which is uh, dependence on one another, togetherness, unity, and the importance of support and solidarity. Um, additionally, they LSA has a comprehensive and all encompassing approach um, to all of their work. I'll go into some programs that stood out that many clients mentioned in a moment, but um, a common uh, sentiment that many expressed was the fact that any question they had, any doubt they had was answered by someone from LSA. If they went to, if they went to them asking their question or having any kind of need, it was delivered upon, whether it was that staff member who knew the answer or they found another organization or they found um, a healthcare service, there, there's that all-encompassing approach that nothing is off the table. Um, 
Additionally, there is empowerment starting with the individual, which translates to the future leadership presence at the organization and in the community. Um, hearing from one of the clients, Raina C., um, she, she has continued working at the food pantry after um, she attended the food pantry uh, a, few, a few years ago. So that relationship is sustained. And then another theme that I recognize is the fact that um, from early childhood, from pregnancy to birth to uh, middle school, high school, beyond and everything in between, um, there is support from the organization in um, helping the children thrive and helping the, uh, helping the family thrive um, as well. So some programs that stood out in my research and analysis um, were the parenting groups. Many of the clients um, de uh, detailed their apprehension to join um, at first as they, they, felt, they felt nervousness and alienation um, being all alone in the community and they didn't know if they would um, be welcome there, but it proved the opposite and they found solidarity in a really, um, a really great group to turn to for advice and just to know that they're not alone. Um, as well as daycare and early childhood development programs um, where many expressed that their children learned music, they read them books, um, and this could all take place at while the parents were attending the parenting groups or while they were at work. Um, there was also a huge focus on mental health and therapy, both for children and adults, um, as well as for children, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy. Um, and then on the health side, on the physical health side, there's there was asthma care. Um, Ray was brought up many times in um, the the getting to the root of the issue in apartments. Um, many people expressed their gratitude that um, when their children suffered from asthma, they got rid of the mold in their apartments and everything. They had um, a great support system there, and then as well as nursing and healthcare. Um, continued, there were English classes which mothers expressed. Uh, was very helpful in their uh, helping their children with their homework. Um, most did not um, come to the U.S. with any English skills, so they expressed that um, those classes were very beneficial for them. Um, computer classes as well, which also helped with their uh, helping their children. And then access to education. Many of the women I spoke to continued their education, um, receiving uh, receiving certificates in teaching and finishing their high school education. And then also community events and activities, like specifically the community garden. Um, a client, Elvira, that I spoke to um, said that this was quite enjoyable for her and her children. As they grew food, they got to see the fruits of their labor and they got to connect with other families in the community, which I thought was quite significant because, um, because it's, it shows that mutuality is not just LSA's approach from staff to client, but it's also um, cultivated cultivated through um, client relationships with other families and forming um, forming those strong friendships and um, other supports to lean on. And um, maintaining relationships and community leadership. I also um, already spoke about how one um, client now works at the food pantry and there is another who was employed at um, a thrift shop would help to find that work through lsa um, and there's also the the concept of just the cultivation of trust and um the complete uh the complete dedication to the whole family um to the fact that when the individual thrives the community thrives um, and as I said before, it's not a superficial approach, but it's nuanced and profound. And with that individualized attention, um, families have expressed such change that they saw in their lives and such positive impact from the organization that, um, that will not soon be forgotten. So to hear from all of these women and to uh, analyze all of this data has been 
quite humbling. Um, as Rosanna said, I agree. Uh, I'm very honored to have been involved and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Maddie. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, wonderful. Well, we have two more student presentations until we open it up to very brief faculty responses and then open it up to Q&A. And we have our two Carloses. So let's begin with Carlos O, who is graduating from undergrad tomorrow and hosting his very large Peruvian extended family in New York City this week. So Carlos, it's amazing you're here with us considering what's happening for you this week. So thank you so much, Carlos. No, thank you everyone for having me, for having given me the opportunity to be part of this amazing project. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen one second. Can you see it there? Perfect. Okay, well, so I used this presentation as well to present out at the undergraduate research symposium two weeks ago, sort of just wrapping up in the conclusion of the project. And I wanted to focus a lot on the concept that we kept from seeing very recurrent throughout our interviews and our research that was this concept that LSA calls mutuality and how that sort of explores their approach to how they do service and how they live their own spirituality. Um, so the concept of mutuality as it has been defined by the research and by LSA is a power with relational model of care that aims to foster a sense of self-worth, agency and confidence in both the family served and the LSA staff. In other words, it's just not the concept of serving the family or helping them in whatever need they might have, but it's more in a mutual relationship in which both the staff of LSA is helping the family, but it's not just helping them, it's helping the family to help themselves. And this is the key aspect that wraps up the whole idea of the service model that LSA has with these families. So we did 18 interviews with LSA programs, former participants or the clients. And then we also did a seven interviews to several LSA staff members. And to sort of explore the concept of mutuality, I wanted to highlight um, four quotes from four different interviews, one of them from a staff member and three of them from clients that I will then sort of analyze to try to explain a little bit more of this concept of mutuality and how it's vital and present on all of the work that LSA does. So the first one is, it came from the interview that we did with Mr. Stan and Sister Margaret. And they, they said quite accurately, mutuality is really saying that we're all in this together. How do you lift up their voices of the families themselves so that they express the need so they can impact the change? And that's, that's a key concept, that it's not just a model of service to the people that you're helping and that you're working with, but it's more than coming up with this model to strengthen their dignity and just humanize them as people that are also struggling within this process, but helping them for them to lift their voice and to understand and learn how to help themselves, not only for them, but for their families, for their children, and at the end of the day, for their community, which is what is most important with this kind of, of service models. Then this I took from an interview from Elvira Contreras, a former client from LSA, and she said, Eugenia visited me at home. She read him, him referring to her son, the little books she called, she talked to him, taught me how I could start to educate him. She really helped me a lot, everything she taught me. Belief that all families and little sisters have touched, have been influenced, that they were going to be someone in life. And this just really explores how the concept of mutuality and highlighting their, their dignity as a human person actually gave them hope, gave them hope to continue for them, for their family. And just as she was saying, to, to be someone in life, not necessarily only for them, but throughout all the stories that we hear about them helping educate these children and 
getting them scholarships, putting them through high school, putting them through college, and making them really successful professionals. It just highlights this concept that they were working under. Then Reina Carraza, another client, she said, she, her daughter, was afraid of everything, and thank God I found the little sisters. They have been a great support for me in any little thing that I didn't know. I used to be afraid of everything, asking for help, asking for anything. They told me, no, don't be afraid. We're going to help you. They always helped me. They accompanied me to places. I had to seek help for my children. They helped me a lot. To this day, I participate in helping them in my free time. And that last sentence of her quote was another key element that we kept on seeing recurrent in all of the interviews. There was the concept of mutuality just really made them be an active participant in the process of change. And it was just a recurrent fact that most of the clients that were helped at some point by LSA would come up eventually back to LSA as workers to participate helping others in the programs. So it's very a cyclical model in which it's just not we are here to serve you and help you out, but it's more we're here to help you help yourself. And then because we're very ingrained in the values of this community, which in this case is, is Harlem, we encourage you to once you have learned from our service and our help to come back to this program and help out helping others, give back to your community. And then it's one of my favorite interviews that was with Enelia Suarez. Um, she said, I'm really very grateful to the agency because when one arrives in this country, especially the language problem, for many people, it is a problem. Fortunately, there were always people who spoke Spanish and the little sisters, I believe that the people who work there are people, I believe, who have that human quality and that vocation to do their job. And she's referring to one, the language barrier in which most of the clients are native Spanish speakers. A lot of them don't speak English when they come to this country. But the other one is, it, it, it explains a lot in their service mentality that it's, they have this humanity and this human quality and this vocation to serve the community and to show these people that in the face of adversity, they still own their humanity and their dignity and to humanize these clients, not just by the numbers at large, but get into their stories, get deep into what their problems are and try to humanize them to help them in whatever way they possibly can. So sort of to wrap up, revisiting the concept of mutuality. This service model that is rooted in mutuality in which it tries to lift up the voices of the people that is being served. Based on all the interviews that we did has been extremely successful. And it has been applied to all of the programs that LSA has been doing just because it is the overall mentality that LSA is using in order to conduct their programs. So we kept on asking one of the key questions that was, if there is anything that you would like to say to LSA that they should do that they're not doing, what would it be? And one of the answers that they kept on giving was to keep on focusing on the community to help in whatever way they could, to not necessarily act by the numbers and in terms of the funding and how many people they could help, but more as in help as much as they possibly could, the people they were helping, because the work that they're making, they actually made a long lasting impact for generations to come in this in these families. And to wrap up with a quote from Sister Susanna Chappelle, as she said, and I think this sort of embodies the work of LSA, where together as we shape the world, so everyone has a place to call home. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you. Wow, you even had the screenshots of the Zoom interviews, so we got to see the faces of some of the people we interviewed. Thank you, Carlos. So for our final student presentation, we have Carlos Rojas from the School of Social Work. Thank you. Thank you. I like um, the the rest of um, the student panel um, express my gratitude. This was really a pleasure. Um, I am also a first generation immigrant, came to the United States with zero English at age nine from Colombia. So to work oh. in my native language, you know, was certainly a pleasure and to be able to contribute um, is something that, you know, I feel very, uh, very special about. I don't have um, a formal presentation. Um, I feel like 
my um, student colleagues covered a lot when it came to um, the three-phase model, um, the concept of mutuality, but there will be some things that I'm going to highlight that I felt sort of jumped at me. I reviewed a couple of the interviews in Spanish, um, and there were some things that sort of uh, jumped out at me as, as, uh, um, as possible themes. One of them was um, in establishing the concept of mutuality, I think the work with immigrants is especially challenging, particularly coming from Latin America, because the concept of social services does not exist there in the same way as it does here. So getting connected to the services seemed to be something that um, it came through mutual relations you know, in the community. As we all know, the issue of trust um, for immigrants is at a premium. So I think that how those issues intersect is something to, you know, to take into consideration, right? Um, because the way we look at social services here in the United States is not the way they're defined you know, in Latin America. And the immigrants that we're working with wouldn't define them as such either. So the idea of creating that connection you know, initially can be a challenge. And it was uh, evident in, in the interviews. Um, many of the people who came before me mentioned a lot of the concrete services, which were evident in the, in the interviews that I reviewed. Um, you know, food security, um, help with uh, from birth all the way to adulthood with children, um, tutoring, English classes, legal services. Um, that all came up in the interviews. But what I thought was particularly uh, of, of, was powerful was that in the interviews I reviewed, there was an essence of social connection and human connection. Carlos mentioned that, Maddie mentioned that, so did Rosanna. This idea that it, they weren't just clients, which goes back to the mutuality um, topic, um, it was personal connections and it was just a recurrent theme throughout the interviews. Um, one of the quotes that uh, came out of the interviews that I reviewed, which I thought was particularly poignant, you know, um, one of the interviewees mentioned that uh, LSA no te deja morir sola, which translates to the LSA will not let you die alone, um, which I thought was, you know, a powerful message. Um, and one of the other interviews that I reviewed, um, one of the interviewees mentions LSA, again, going back to this, you know, concept of human connections, um, they refer to LSA as un refugio seguro, which is a secure refuge, um, which again, I think highlights the, the personal connection in the sense of, you know, feeling treated as Carlos mentioned as a human being. Um, um, I think the other part that I wanted to highlight, which was also evident in my interviews, was that they, they did, in the interviews I reviewed, there was an expression of a sense of loss um, over time. Although Carlos mentioned in, in the interviews um, that I uh, reviewed was also apparent, this idea of uh, intergenerational connectedness that you know parents brought their children back for additional support one of the things that I found um, evident in, in my review was that they also, in a very nostalgic way, sort of looked back at the growth with, LS, with LSA as uh, containing a sense of loss that, you know, some of that, those personal connections, you know, running into the little sisters in the community, which would often happen, and that was something that they mentioned in the interviews, as the agency became more of an agency, uh, the interviewees described it, you know, as sort of losing a bit of that connectedness that, you know, they had grown accustomed to um, in their experience. So, you know, I did sort of pick up, you know, a, a sense of loss from, from the interviewees that, uh, that uh, whose interviews I reviewed. Um, I feel like that's, in terms of the, the interviews that I reviewed, those are the things that sort of, you know, jumped out at me in addition to uh, the stuff that, you know, my fellow students already have covered. Um, I once again, you know, thank you for the opportunity um, and being able to contribute to such a, you know, important uh, piece of work. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was a, a complete pleasure to be able to work in this capacity in my native language. So I thank you for the opportunity.
Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you so much for um, that, that final student presentation. That was wonderful. Um, maybe we can just um, unmute and do just a round of applause for Rosanna, Dita, Melinda, Maddie, Carlos O, and Carlos R. Thank you so much. Um, it was just wonderful to hear your reflection. So let's just take maybe one minute, the faculty members can just respond just really briefly. I know the students have heard a lot from us over this year, so um, I don't feel the need to say, to say a whole lot, but I'm just very grateful for the time and care you put into those reflections. Mm -hmm. um, but let's start with Dr. Farmer and then Dr. Kasten, and then I can just say something real brief and then we will open it up for comments and questions. Yeah, well, again, I, I really was, um, it was a pleasure to kind of hear all of you together, kind of your individual reflections. And while there was a lot of overlap, there was some things that sort of came out uniquely that's, that I've heard for the first time, even though we've had conversations about, um, you know, what was coming out of the interviews previously. And the one thing that, one thing that sort of really stuck out to me, and, and I think I, it's one of the things we, I'd like to see us maybe dig more deeply into, is this idea that mutuality also really supported or addressed sort of the silencing of immigrant women, right? It gave, gave the women, you know, who were the primary sort of caregivers in terms of who we were interviewing, um, it really elevated their voice um, and elevated their ability to sort of take um, a more, empowered, you know, proactive um, approach to not only supporting their own development, the development of their children and their families. Um, so I, I really, I really found that really interesting to highlight the way in which the, the work that's being done by LSA really elevates the voices of these women, these immigrant women. Thank you so much, Dr. Farmer. Uh, Dr. Kasten? Yeah, no, I um, would agree. I um, I think it's interesting the way Larry just said it, that while there was a lot of overlap, there was some new things that came out. So I, just to kind of list some of the things I heard from everybody in different ways was the way that this project resonates with everybody individually. Um, and I, I think that's important to mention because of who we are and the work that LSA does, right? Um, and, and when Rox when Rosanna, Rosanna talked about identity, right? We all carry these identities, our own personal identities as women, men, immigrants, whatever with us in the world. And so there were different ways that we, we approach this research and, and I heard that in everybody's um, presentations. I also um, heard a lot of gratitude. And so I just wanted to, to underscore that. Um, but I will add to what Larry just said about um, the voices of immigrant women uh, the idea of intersectionality was really interesting to me. And I also thought the um, idea of uh, the of mutuality and the three phase model as a cyclical model um, was really compelling as an idea that, um, because we talked about this, uh, the number of women that we interviewed who also came back to the community um, and continue to come back to this community in different uh, ways and different capacities over a very long, you know, like a 20 year span. Um, and so even that term, a cyclical model really resonated with me. Um, and then I will say um, the interdisciplinarity of this project that several people brought up was really interesting as a, as a listener. Uh, Carlos, O quoted an interview that I did, and it was it was a little bit moving to hear the quote and to see the picture of Anelvia and to remember the moment that we shared together, just on a, a personal level, how um, moving it it is to be a part of a project that um, like your perspective changes, right? I was a first person participant in that interview, and then I got to see that uh, as an outsider, and and it it. Uh, I've never experienced that before. So thank you, Carlos, for that. Um, Brenna, I'll pass it on to you. 
Okay, thanks so much, Carrie. I'll just be really brief, but students, thank you so much for the work that you've done. And um, this is just giving us so much material to reflect with as we kind of move this into the writing stage over the summer. And I think we just, without really knowing, you know, gather this great team of so many of you have firsthand experience with this and themselves, you know, are Spanish speakers or insider outsiders in New York yourselves. And that just so made you such more excellent researchers, not only, you know, able to relate to them, but able to like be in touch with that part of yourself as you engage with that research. So that was just wonderful to see. So thank you for putting that out there and for being yourselves um, as scholars and researchers. And, um, you know, just a couple quick things that I was thinking, you know, one of the things I've been torn with is that the women that we interviewed are so positive about LSA. And, and so I felt torn, like, sometimes in intellectual life you think or I have been trained to think that you kind of point out problems you know you kind of point out problems is the more like intellectual angle but what do you do with sources that are so grateful and so positive you know it's like you kind of need another hook or or something but I was kind of thinking you know so I was just kind of thinking about that as either like something we might need to think about like is that potentially like a deference to authority maybe a limitation in the sources or is it something to kind of think with intellectually, like, well, what, you know, what, you know, what kind of model does LSA offer of things that actually do work and things that have been moving in the right direction in terms of community service and solidarity and justice in East Harlem. So that's just something, something that I need to think to think with. And I also appreciated Larry and Kara, you pointing out this this notion of the cyclical that after 20 years, people coming back to volunteer. And I think of some of these, what I think of as like inner inner words that we saw so much in the interviews, especially those that you put up on the, um, that Dita and Carlos put on the screens of things like, I didn't have confidence, you know, I didn't have confidence, things that are like about like social life and emotion and how ultimately like, that return to LSA to be a volunteer is an expression of agency and more confidence that is reclaimed in the neighborhood after so many years. So that's just, I think that's just something really interesting to think about. Um, but we will do lot, lots more reflection. But right now, because we're still in the you know, draft stage, the responses and questions or comments or potential angles um, or anything, um, comments or questions from the LSA staff, board members, we'll be so grateful to hear since this is still a work in progress. But I mostly want to just really thank you, Carlos, Carlos, Maddie, Melinda, Dita, Rosanna, for your wonderful work this year. Um, but while we'll stop there and open it up, and maybe um, if you have a question, you can. Um, just unmute yourself and and jump in. Although, you know, I know at school we often use the blue hands, but I know that not everyone knows how to do that. Um, why don't you just, if you, you can either use your blue hand if you know how to do that, um, you type in the, the reaction, but right now my blue hand doesn't turn on. I, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So if you have a question, you maybe unmute yourself or you can type in the chat. Um, and I will, I'll call on you. Um, I think Monica, do you have your hand up? Okay, yeah, Monica, and then go ahead, Monica. Okay, yeah. so um, hi, um, I'm Monica, I'm the director of mental health services at LSAID and I was late, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, very moved by the last stories. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, you know, Carlos Rojas, I think is a Colombian, I'm also a Colombian, so, uh, you know, this is, is the first time that I see somebody close in, working closely where I am, have been working at LSA. I have been there for six years and a half. And, you know, everything that you talk about, like really connecting with the clients and how deep sometimes the relationships go, it's so right on point. Uh, one of the things that has been more amazing is that, you know, I come to a, a community with mental health. It's, you know, it's a lot of stigma. Um, and I come, you know, uh, trying to create or place a program that is eclectic. It's so important. I study art therapy and psychology. And so I'm doing that and it's really working from processing trauma. Um, and yes, the connection is because Little Sister as an agency really has a connection with the community that goes 60 years uh, you know, back. So I have clients and sometimes you think about, you know, I have a client that I actually work with 
And then the clients say, you know, my mom needs therapy and it's now all the family. Um, so it's a really great window to see um, not only the resilience of the immigrant community, but also that it's people that is engaged in really trying to better themselves in so many ways, like getting, you know, um, they are really trying to integrate in this culture. Mm -hmm. So it has been really amazing to be able mm -hmm. to do the work of trauma mm -hmm. because to do that work, you need people to trust what they are. And really little sister, many clients say to me, little sister is my second home, if not my only home. So thank you so much for doing this. It feels, yeah. I'm kind of like moving, very excited to hear all the stories. Yeah. Thank you, Monica. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And you know, the trust that mm -hmm. these women had um, have in LSA enabled us to do these interviews. I mean, the quality mm -hmm. of the interviews and the kind of things they shared with us is so mm -hmm. rich, so much richer than if we would have just like put an ad, you know, paid participant. I mean, this was really like, it was like us and then mostly in Hinia kind of standing in between us and the clients. And it really, um, you know, she was the one who gave us the names of everybody, but they all have. And you just think of these were women from quite a long time ago, but you're doing all of this now. And Monica, I know you're doing incredible work. So thank you. Yeah. I have yeah. a question for Carlos. Oh, oh sorry. Before oh. I move, what? he says something about the clients feel nostalgic mm -hmm. and feeling that they lost something mm -hmm. kind of like mm -hmm. in the process of the years. I know because, you know, ec economical issues, uh, many programs for adults close. And I wanted to ask you if they say a specific what they are nostalgic about. It's just they lost like, mm -hmm. like losing programs for adults um, or it's something about the relationship. I think okay, it was, yeah, thanks, yeah, go ahead, Carlos, and then Rita. Thanks, Monica. I think it was more related to the relationships. I think, you know, as again, and I'm not as familiar with LSA, but the way I would sort of equate it is, you know, some of the growing pains as you go from a small agency, mm -hmm. right, to a larger agency, this idea that you're losing personal connections um, and, you know, that sort of gets lost in the growth. I got the sense that it was more about that, uh, more so than, than the losing programs. Thank you. Rita? Uh, I just wanted to first, you know, I'm just blown away. I have to say that first. And thank you all so much for undertaking this. It is, you know, in some ways, I have to tell you, it's wonderfully illuminating. In another way, it's not surprising at all. Uh, I think that, that much of the work, you know, and I think the little sisters, I've been with the sisters about six years now. So all of this goes way, way beyond me. But I think this, the little sisters were really innovative in the sense that you know, what, what you all are describing as the, the responses from the people you interviewed, a lot, you know, today, you know, so what, 20 years earlier, maybe, we would call them social determinants of health, okay? That, that's what we are calling them now, and that's what funders are calling them now. Uh, you know, all of these kind of fundamental things, including the, this connectedness, is part of those social determinants. And so the little sisters have always been, you know, it's like a rose by any other name. Um, and then I will, uh, just to address this, the issue of, um, of, of isolation, this is this kind of interesting story. I met, this was before the pandemic, with Dr. Jeremy Bowl. And Jeremy is the president of Mount Sinai downtown, Mount Sinai, is Israel, Beth Israel. And he is also the chief medical officer of the entire Mount Sinai system. Uh, Ray knows him from years ago. I think he did part of his residency or part of his public health residency at, at LSA when he was a young doctor and has remained very attached. And when I went to see him and I met him for the first time, he said to me, one of the really important things about LSA was this sense of community because uh, Jeremy Bowl described what he said was an epidemic of loneliness and an epidemic of isolation. So here we have the chief of medicine of the entire Mount Sinai system telling me that, the, the, you know, exactly, you know, what LSA tries to do with the mutuality is sort of precisely what's needed 
maybe nationwide. I, I, it, you know, so it, it was a very interesting, it, it really struck me as, as you described this overwhelming feeling you know, of, of connectedness. So I think that it's both personal loss Carlos, is your, who said that? Carlos, personal loss, uh, you know, as well as, uh, you know, you know, some of the, the, the kind of systemic, this, what's around us, what's all around us. And obviously this last year, you know, just like, like the pandemic has heightened, you know, all of the great disparities, you know, and inequities that exist, I think, this loneliness issue, this sense of isolation is one of those issues as well. So I just think this is, this is remarkable. And my first instinct, and Arthur, you know, you, you will probably rein me in a little bit, uh, you know, would be to send the whole thing to all of our donors. <laughs> because I think this is such a value, so valuable, you know, for, for them to hear. So I, I, I'm just blown away and I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much, Rita. Thank you. That means a lot to us. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, just speaking just on the pandemic, like we all, the researchers were in the pandemic too. And that it was so, we were so tempted, of course, to give up on this research, but honestly, this kept us connected to one another and then even connected to something positive. It was like, there's so much horror in the world this year. And then you're kind of interviewing these people and it was really probably Zoom made this more possible this year because it wasn't like schlep from Queens to East Harlem or the Bronx or Brooklyn, you know, we're all over it. It was just on Zoom and the clients had Zoom mostly on their phone. And um, it, it was able to kind of stay connected to something good in the midst of this really tough year. So it really, I think, helped us emotionally this year too, kind of sticking with this project. So thanks, Rita. Um, anybody else? I know you're on two screens, so I hope I'll be able to facilitate the, the comments okay, but feel free just to, to unmute or kind of wave your hand. While people are thinking, maybe I'll say something that, uh, you know, Rita, you just asked, uh, Carlos, the question about nostalgia, right? Was that Rita's question? Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we did talk about uh, was that some of the clients that we interviewed did mention changes at LSA. And I think we've only mm -hmm. kind of scratched the surface of um, what those changes um, are. And, and other people referred to yeah. them in their presentations. Um, but some of them are like, I think we've learned are, are city mm -hmm. mandated, right? Like. Um, and some of them were institutional changes at LSA. Yeah. But I yeah. do think that that's something um, that could be interesting for mm. us to explore. Yeah, well, um, it is. Me, yeah, I mean, a lot of this, of course, revolves around funding. So in the days when Sister Judy, I know, Sister Margaret, you, you I, I heard this story. In the days when Sister Judy was the ED and she didn't get enough money from a foundation, she would pick up the phone and said, you didn't send me enough money. You need to send me more money. Okay. So those are the kind of stories, you know, I've heard. But of course, we're, we, we live in a, a very different society and it all kind of got professionalized. I think that's some of, 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 of how I would put it. Uh, and so I think that professionalization, which was necessary in order to survive in an ever more competitive needful environment with shrinking funding on every side, really forced every human service, you know, uh, I think agency into a similar posture because you can't do this kind of work, you know, you know without the one-on-one -on -one human connection uh, and, and make it, I mean, we did it during the pandemic because we didn't have options and it was certainly better than no, no connection, but if you're going to do this work and do it effectively, you know, it takes staff and that takes money and all of the stuff that goes. So unfortunately, you know, program gets driven by money. We try not to create program just to get money because that's when you get mission drift. So we try to create, if we're creating or expanding program, we try to do it, you know, with, now we're looking at doing not just within the realm of our mission, but with, under the realm of sort of the five key social determinants of health, you know, where we're, we're looking to, to, to tweak our programs 
because we're already doing it mostly. So we're so, this, so that becomes the overarching the overarching theme. So all of these are you know issues today. You know as we have grown into a more sectarian agency, tried not to lose the spirituality inherent, you know, in helping one's you know fellow human being. So this has been a tricky, you know, a little bit of a tricky line. Right. Yeah, so. absolutely. I think that is, a, you know, an interesting tension we can point to. You know, there's lots of little anecdotes in the interviews. I think it was Gail was brought up in some of the interviews how she would sometimes even help someone in the neighborhood wake up on time to get to a school interview. And, you know, just that real, like, you know, just neighborhood person to per very, very personal approach. And that's different from the professionalized approach. And Gail, I see you're hopping back on, but did I see Gail, your hand up earlier? I know your camera isn't quite on you, but I didn't want to miss you. I thought I might've seen your uh, arm up. I didn't, I didn't have my hand up, but I did want to um, make a comment because I was really incredibly impressed with what came out of the interviews. And because of the whole three um, phase model, as well as mutuality that, and I know that foundations are looking at systemic change and that's what they want to fund. And I feel that if we could tweak what was discovered and we could expand the number of interviews over time, that we could show that what LSA is really doing is systemic change because right. it's recreating this community out of a group of people who are very isolated who then become leaders so that Good. in my thinking is true systemic change yeah Gail, Gail to address that really quickly that's exactly what we're aiming for you know is to embed research in all of the programs you know so that so that we can multiply you know the you know it, it becomes a multiplier effect uh, so that what we've become basically is an incubator for best practices in the areas of our expertise. Uh, so one of the things we're looking to do is hire a director of research and policy development in order to sort of put, pull together kind of the skeins of research, do more and out of that develop best practices uh, and policies and give us a seat at the policy table, which is where you know, where, well, where that change starts to happen as well. But I, but I, I think there are a group of us looking mm -hmm. at what the core values are. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are the ideas that we want to reinforce across all programs, all staff, so that people who work at Little Sisters really imbue those core values in the way in which they interact with the idea that we learn as much from our clients as our clients learn from us. Mm -hmm. Great, Gail. Yeah, I, I absolutely. That really resonates with what with what we were thinking about too. So we can think about like the genre of this academic piece we have to write, right. but then maybe there's something else we can do that would be more useful, shorter for grants. Um, Melina, I saw your hand up. Melina Gonzalez. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bernard. It's an honor to be here with all of you, especially those who did the interviews. Thank you so much for taking the time and have a conversation with all of us. I mean, as I'm, I'm really excited to see so many familiar faces as Lorraine, Jackie, Sister Margaret Leonard, I mean, Sister Susan, Sister Daisy. It is because of the mission of the Little Sisters that our, um, our community have continued growing. As I mentioned it before, we have an extraordinary group of leaders in our community that we need to embrace, and that's our clients. It's not without the mission and the power of growth. And it says in their, um, in their statement, the power of growth is in relationships. And we have to continue that. We have, as Gail mentioned just right now, we have to continue looking at our clients and grow with them along with them, with them, not next to them, is along with them. I know that a lot of changes are coming into with new administrations, with new changes, but I think that the respect, the dignity that all our families deserve is priority. Right. Uh, as an immigrant woman myself, mother of the first generation college graduated my family, I think it's an amazing to hear, it is amazing to hear that some of you are first generation. 
and that you understand the need of our communities and the need of our children. And especially they understand how difficult it is for an immigrant family to go through the system. So on behalf of all of us, and let's say in our families, thank you so much. Elena, your name came up so often in our reflections as sort of the this this incredible, an incredible ideal story of LSA, you know, with your past and then returning to LSA as this incredible leader. That was beautiful what you said, and I'm so glad we're recording this. Just that little paragraph you spoke was beautiful, Melina. Thank you so much. Um, that's incredible. Sonia, I see your hand. Sonia is a board member. So, and Carlos, oh, she's um, Zooming in from Peru. Yeah, yeah, I am Peruvian. <laughs> and I am a member of the board. And I, I want to highlight the importance of this study. Uh, Brenna, you know how much we were interested in uh, having these results. And uh, I'm really so happy because we need evidence of our impact. And, um, and I think we, we need to show to the board this, this study. And I want to congratulate the way that you presented um, choosing the student to do this um, and having the faculties. Uh, I think this is really um, very good for LSA. And um, the, the challenge is that the uh, funding uh, organizations normally, they see numbers more than quality. Uh, so I, I think maybe the idea that Gail uh, shared with us about in the future extending the number, it will be brilliant because of course it, it show a systemic um, impact but also for, for the, the organization that look uh, numbers, we can also um, have the, 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 two, the two angles. So that is what I want to say. Thank you very much to everybody for doing this research. Your work uh, has been amazing. Thank you so much, Sonia. I, I, I think that, um, I love the way you put it, like we needed some evidence of the work of LSA. And I think that's exactly what this, this all, you know, and what was great is that the students on this committee and the, and Dr. Farmer and somewhat Dr. Kasten, like didn't really know a ton about LSA. Dr. Kasten has partnered with classes, but like this, all of those stories totally from the ground up, those are completely from the interviews themselves. So it's totally a kind of a, a grassroots bottom-up analysis. It's purely from the evidence. So that was well put, Sonia. Um, and so I see Monica's hand. So I'm gonna ask Monica, and then we just have maybe like four more minutes and then Dr. Kasten's gonna offer some closing remarks. But I wondered after Monica, if Sister Suzanne or Ray or Margaret, Sister Margaret or Trish, somebody who's, you know, has been in LSA, has those like long, decade, two decade plus experience with LSA. If there's any comment or question they have, I just wanted to like pass the mic over to them. Um, and Monica, but yes, go, go ahead, Monica. So, yeah, I, I think I, I wanted to address something that Sonia says about, you know, when you serve families, they are for 20 years or for 25 years. And I talk about this with, you know, with other staff members of LSA, because sometimes for funding, it's kind of like, oh, really? People are staying there that long. But what happened is the LSA, it's in the small scale, is renewing services and is doing things that really help clients when the next generation comes. So in more classes for PCD, more help with sport after school, uh, you know, and so, and mental health is a new program that has been there for six years. So if clients come back looking for mental health, I think it's a game because they are trusting so much that they wanted to go and really, really work and emotional, you know, self and helping their kids. So just that to highlight that, that I really like what I think uh, what say also is the, the voice of women that are empowered. One of the presentations that I do is called Empowering Invisible between uh, women with sustained trauma. So I think it's that it's that these women are so strong, are so resilient, are, it has so much wisdom that it has been an honor and is really an opportunity to show how immigrant families really come and with the struggles, help the kids to go to college 
or move, you know, the next generation. And what we really wanted to do is, and the work that it has been doing in mental health is transgenerational trauma, how we can really cut that and really help these kids to move out of, you know, the difficulties. Even when parents come here with nothing, not English, not money, the kids are able to go to college. And I think that's one of the things that have been more admirable about your study. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. So we have time maybe for two more questions, two more comments or questions. Let's say Lorraine, and then if there's anyone else. Um, I, I'm so grateful for uh, all of you for, for working on this and doing the interviews uh, and um, for being able to hear it. I'm, I'm retired from Little Sisters for, for 10 years now, um, but uh, it, it as a sense of mutuality, this has, this has uh, reminded me of the work and it, it's changed me. It's made me feel so good to listen to this and to feel that my work at Little Sisters, my life work, uh, was so helpful to the community and to the larger world. And I think that that's very, uh, when people are on staff, to know that they're making a contribution that lasts for over generations makes a big difference to being able to sustain the work and having the relationships that are developed help you grow as a staff person forever and it changes you forever and I think that's an important thing to remember and I'm so grateful to everyone to be reminded of all of this at this point tonight. Oh, thank you so much. It's so true. Oh my goodness hearing what they said, yeah, about you all. So it's incredible. And, and Trish, I see your hand. Hi, yes. Trish. Um, I just wanna say thank you, Brenna. What a beautiful blessing that you've brought with research and stories which connect to the real, you know, the reality of Little Sisters in East Harlem and how as time goes on, when you lose you know, it can be easy to lose the history and not just the history, but the real impact that when, you know, it's all about the numbers and the, who's gonna give you money because you have the numbers that this, the impact gets lost. And so what you have done here is just, it's amazing. And thank you. And thank you to all these you know, I'm one of these old timers, you know, God bless, you know, all of us old timers. And it's hard to sort of, you know, keep a voice because that's life. Things change, new people come and, but we continue to tell the stories which are real. And I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody here on this call. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Trish. And Trish was the one that first welcomed me into LSA. So really like, thanks to Trish is the, who got me involved in that ended up, you know, the, the impetus for the research and, and so many staff people have been so welcoming to us. And it just, you know, this spirit of mutuality is not just the staff and clients, but like includes volunteers. And, and it is, Trish, you've been such a great part of that for so long. So, so thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just want to add. To yeah, go ahead, Sister Margaret. Um, to what you said about Trish, because she has been with us for a number of years and have been such a gift and as so many of the women who have spoken you know they, i just have so many memories of their life and their commitment over many years and i would like to just simply say thank you to you brenna brenna you've been a real gift to us through this whole process you saw the possibility and you moved ahead on it and expanded it and developed it. And we are all so very grateful to you and your commitment. And we look forward to a number of possibilities in the future that are going to come forth from, from the gift that you and the, and it's nice to, I have to say, having, having graduated from Florida many years ago, you know, it's wonderful to see uh, the commitment of Fordham University as well. And thank you. Uh, so anyway, I just want to say thank you. And um, we are more than grateful. Oh, thank you so much, Sister Margaret. It's so true. And, um, and I know, you know, the feeling is so mutual. And it has really given us at Fordham a, a deeper sense of 
of possibility and purpose about what research can really be about. And it's been really a meaningful experience. And I think this is a perfect note to, to turn the mic over to Dr. Kasten and Carrie, who's gonna offer a couple of comments um, of, of reflection as we close and we'll finish up right on time. So Carrie, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you everybody. I just wanted to, I'm gonna be really brief, but there were three things I just wanted to highlight. One is the future plans of this project as we move forward. Um, then I just wanted to talk briefly about uh, this project as kind of a model for the future for community engaged learning. And then finally, uh, a final thank you. Um, so uh, Brenna, uh, explain that that uh, uh, Dr. Farmer, Dr. Moore and I are going to take uh, this um, the presentations from the students and um, information that they're handing in and we're going to uh, put our heads together over the next couple of months and and work on an academic article. Um, we haven't talked about the partnership with the Center for Religion and Culture, who's working with LSA um, on a video and and Brennan's been been instrumental in in taking those first steps. And so that's exciting. And, and I think it remains to be seen whether it's a promotional video or how LSA wants to use that. Um, but that's exciting. And lots of people have mentioned the, the room for growth that is here and the room can to conduct more interviews and to take this uh, research further. And so it's exciting that this really just opened the door to further conversations. And um, I know we're all kind of uh, our heads are spinning from the crazy year that everybody in this Zoom has has undertaken this past year. And, and I think having some time to kind of sit with it, some quiet time and then reconnect in the in the uh, fall again would be would be great. Um, you know, I've been doing community engaged learning for about 10 years at Fordham, and this is really such a unique experience where uh, students and faculty and community partners have come together um, in a spirit of sharing and working together, uh, mutuality, <laughs> if you will, um, uh, in a way that's really exciting and that I've never seen before. And, and I, I think that, again, it's just uh, potentially the beginning of something bigger, but this idea of doing research together and really learning from each other um, is, is new for all of us here. And, and uh, I think that we really um, learned so much from this experience and look forward to where it can take us in the future. And then everybody has said thank you tonight, but I do just wanna underscore um, the sense of gratitude that I think uh, all of us at Fordham feel to LSA for really opening the doors to us. Uh, I think uh, the clients, the women we interviewed really put themselves in a vulnerable position and shared so much information and really trusted us with um, their life stories. And, and the fact that they did that speaks volumes to how they feel about their relationship with LSA and, and um, what you all have done for them. It was a real privilege to hear their stories and to spend time with them. Um, and so thank you for giving us that opportunity and, and just to acknowledge the work that you do um, one more time. So thanks everybody. It is 7.30 on the dot. Um, I don't know if anybody, uh, has anything else, but if not, maybe we can all just unmute and say goodbye and thank you so much. And thank it will, you, we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and wonderful Everybody's job. Yeah. Ahead of the school social work. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much, everybody. Thank you everybody. Thank thank you. so much. Brenna, Thanks, Brenna. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye. Excellent presentations. Yeah, they did a great job. Yeah, they did. They did an excellent yeah. job. Brandon, you hit another home run for us. I don't know oh. how to thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Dr. So. Farmer and 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 Kat, yeah. Brandon's been on screen for us. This is the second time, what, in 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 10 days or so. And and last week she hosted a donor and partner update for us, which was fascinating because. You know, she talked a little bit, of course, about the, the history of progressive Catholicism. And then, of course, you know, more about how, how LSA grew from that. So mm -hmm. it, it is it's just, it's, it's wonderful. I love it. And, and, you know, what we really want to be able to do is share what we know. And, and this is an interesting tidbit 
for both of you as well. I was at HUD a couple of years ago because we were doing something with the mailman school. It was a national study with HUD that was looking at asthma triggers in the home nationwide. So I met with these guys at HUD that were sort of in charge of that division. And they said that our access to the people that we serve in this population is something that researchers all over the country are like drooling for yeah. because the distrust of the large institutions, you know, is so profound that, you know, that this access that we have is, is, is quite extraordinary. And, you know, I have to say the way I always do, it's the people on the ground, it's the frontline folks, you know, it's, it's the people, you know, I talk about the inequities, you know, so it's the people on the front line that really put themselves out, you know, in, in this, somebody once said to me, a sister Judy used to know the name of every client. And I thought if, if I had to know the name of every client at this point, I'd throw myself out the window. So, yeah. you know, it's just a fascinating look, you know, at, at how does an organization evolve and grow while keeping this personal connection, you know, and, and, and resisting mission drift in pursuit of dollars. Yeah. I think it's a really tough, yeah. tough road to hoe. Yeah. That's a key, a key question we'll pursue in our writing. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Thanks, and yeah. thanks Carrie and thanks Larry and thank you everybody.